if you do something with your, your hands and your mind together, it's a good antidote for the misery of the world. You, you get lost in what you do. While I was at the fire department, I used to do a lot of repair work for uh, players in the area, and some abroad would come in. And um, then I uh, decided I wanted to build. And then I uh, met Russell Burford. We just clicked right, you know, instantly uh, and joined each other's company. So we built about 15 instruments together and um, he got this cancer, you know, and uh, he didn't last long with it. But uh, his brother Tommy, who was the Apple expert I mentioned, uh, he uh, uh, gave me all of Russell's tools that I wanted and uh, that helped. Uh, Russell was a tool maker by trade and, and in the later part of his life I think he knew he was dying but he didn't tell me and neither did Tommy so uh, I carry on the legend of building violins and I've built 75 I'm working on my second cello I've repaired uh, hundreds of instruments and uh, it's been um, a passion of mine ever since I got out of the army I mean, there was never any question for me that I wanted to devote my, my life to the violin, too, in some way. When I finished college, I decided to apply to the Chicago School of Violin Making. And um, I was accepted, and um, during the summertime after finishing college, before I would have started at the Chicago, I, um, I thought that it would give me an advantage starting there if I spent some of the time in the summer just trying to get some extra woodworking skill. Because I um, I'd done a little bit of repair work but I didn't feel like I was completely well versed yet with some of the hand tools. I was, uh, I was looking online one day and there was this violin online um, made by Daniel Smith of Lynchburg. And I was just really taken aback because this, this violin was stunningly beautiful and I had never heard of Danny Smith you know, it was uh, it was a shock to me because uh, I'd been living here for such a long time, and I'd never heard the name mentioned. You know, nobody in the Lynchburg Symphony had one of his violins, and he didn't advertise, so I'd never heard of him. And it was just like, well, how how is it possible that all this time, you know, I've never known who he was? And so I was able to look Danny up in the phone book. He was listed, and so I gave him a call, and I told him that I was looking for some introduction, you know, to using the hand tools. He said, well, why don't you come to my house and we can talk a little bit. So he came over and um, we had a, a we, we talked for probably a couple of hours, but we just hit it off immediately. And at the end of the conversation, Danny said, well, I think what you ought to do is just come make a violin with me. How did you know that Rich would be a good student? Look at him. I mean, you know, I hate to use the word perfect, but we just clicked. Our personalities clicked. Uh, it was no BS, no, you know, putting on airs or anything like that. We just, it's just like two kids getting together and playing. It was just natural. And if you leave us alone, we don't fight. <laughs> like kids, you know. So, um, it was just uh, a, a wonderful blessing in my life. And like I said earlier, um, I learned from him now because of all the information and the instruments. I mean, he, he's played Strads and Gwinnerses. So now I, he's in the circuit as far as trading and, and, and working on instruments and he sends me pictures. And so, you know, it, it, the, the student becomes the teacher and he should. I. Um... I think one of my biggest sources of inspiration um, is actually somebody that I never met, which is my uh, great-great-grandfather. He was the, uh, the first in the family, but um, since I don't know much about his personal history, what I do know is the violins, because we, uh, I grew up playing on um, a number of his instruments, and so being able to see those every day and kind of imagine a future where I could be able to do what he did has always been a source of inspiration. 
I'm the fifth generation in the family to be involved with the violin in some way, um, going back to my great-great-grandfather. You know, I, I feel like every instrument has a personality and it has a story that goes along with it. Just the fact that you can hold an instrument that was played regularly 300 years ago and is still being played the same way now is really astonishing and just the, the sense of being a caretaker for that instrument, you know, having, uh, you know, maybe, maybe only a passing involvement in its life, but uh, getting to do something to maintain that or, you know, maybe even if you're lucky, do something that helps to improve it or, you know, bring it back to the way it used to be if it's had damage. Um, I love getting to have that involvement with it and contribute to the, the history of the instrument. And as we pass, these instruments will, you know, be our legacy. Not that that's our goal, but it will be because these other makers, they left a legacy. If you eat up with violins, <laughs> you enjoy that. It's one of the greatest pleasures of my life is to meet Rich and teach him. And uh, it was an easy job and it, it wasn't work. It was uh, fun. And, I'm, you know, it's good as you... Once you get to the point where you can't do it, <laughs> you teach it. So I'm getting to that point, you know, as far as repair work, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to build. But um, I think you've got a lot of violins left in you. I hope so. He's trying to encourage me to build a viola, then, then I can say I've built I was going to I was going to try and get to that. <laughs> I, yeah. Maybe as a project I want to uh, continue to try to convince Danny to finally make a viola, because he's made cellos now and he's made violins, but... Uh, he hasn't made the last instrument you need for a quartet. Well, so. if I keep this and pass it on in the family, this cello I'm building now, and I build a viola, well, I got plenty of fiddles, so I'll have a quartet to pass on to the children, you know, for part of my legacy. <laughs> uh, I have a four-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son. My, my daughter is playing right now. Uh, I started teaching her a year ago. I mean, you know, you can't control what uh, what they'll choose down the road, but it has to be a part of part of the upbringing at least. And I I certainly do hope that um, one or both of them will someday have the inspiration to uh, to carry it on. Because for me, it's so important to to carry that on and to uh, feel like I'm honoring my ancestors. And uh, I hope that I can pass on that, uh, that same feeling.